Welcome to One Million Cups Kansas City. We are a weekly entrepreneurial program where we host two presenters and they get up and present for about six minutes and then we open it up to the audience for Q&A. If anyone has a question this morning for the presenter, please raise your hand and we will come around with a mic. Uh, my name is Courtney. I'm one of your community organizers along with Milton this morning. We are a little light on the organizing team, but we're gonna make it. Um, so first of all, I'd like to introduce our expert panel, Grant. I'm gonna start, Laura. Hi, my name is Laura. <laughs> uh, morning, my name is Grant Gooding. Um, I've founded a little marketing company here in town called Proof Positioning, where we help entrepreneurs take the guesswork out of how to position themselves in the market by utilizing consumer insights. Um, my area of expertise uh, comes from mergers and acquisitions and free market value. Uh, so that's where I'll be speaking into. Is there a, another Royals game going on this morning that I don't know about? Like, where the hell is everybody? I think still from Thanksgiving. Maybe they're too full. I don't know. Hi, my name is Tommy Saunders. Uh, I have a fitness company, startup fitness company, developing two fitness products, integrating technology, um, and, and just uh, an entrepreneur. So I've made a lot of mistakes, and so that's kind of where uh, I've learned uh, growing my company, so. Thank you. So our first presenter is returning as an alumni today. Um, she has a great concept that we love to have her the first time, so we are excited to bring her back. I would like to welcome Lacey Ellis of Little Hoots. <clears throat> well, hello, good morning. Um, first, I'd like to say thank you for having me back today. It's really exciting to come back and present um, almost a year later. Actually, I was talking to a friend about it last night, and it's been a little more than a year since we presented the first time at One Million Cups. Um, my computer just went to sleep. <laughs> and um, it, it was kind of cool for me last night to to think about how far we've come in one year and to think about what I'm gonna to talk to you guys about today. And um, really what I would like to communicate in this presentation is where we've been, the progress we've made over the past year, and some lessons learned along the way. Um, it's been such an incredible journey, it feels like it's been five years and it's only been one year. <laughs> so um, I've put together a few of those lessons that we've learned and I'm hoping that they'll provide some inspiration for anyone in the audience who's an entrepreneur, especially an entrepreneur that's just starting out. And then I'd like to talk to you a little bit about where we're headed in the future. So this is my son. This is Jet. This is from one of our recent photo shoots. I just kind of wanted to start out with, with this photo um, because this really reminds me of our purpose. Um, what we're all about at Little Hoots is helping parents keep memories. Um, it's those little things that your kids say on a daily basis that are just fantastic, and you want to remember those things, those special moments that you never want to forget. Just a, a little bit more background on who we are and what we're doing. Right now, we have an app on iOS that helps parents capture these quotes and conversations with their kids, but what we're really building and what our vision for the company is in, our, in the future is a memory-keeping platform. So as we move forward, Little Hoots will be the place where parents keep all their very best memories. Sorry about that. I'm going to stay over here in case that happens again. So here's one of the first lessons as I was kind of thinking through um, what would be some interesting points to talk about today. Um, get scrappy. Find a way and be creative. That's something we've really had to do over the past year is just Find any way we can to keep moving forward and stay true to our vision. Um, so that really came to life for us at the beginning of this year around February when a story about one of our kiddos went viral. Um, we noticed when we had only about 1,000 downloads, and this was not long after we presented at One Million Cups last year, this little girl named Greta. And we saw her quotes coming through, and they were hilarious. And so we decided to tell her story. Um, we posted it on a few sites like Board Panda and um, just tried to get it out there. And before we knew it, I had someone from the startup community calling me and saying, 
Lacey, I think you're number seven on Reddit. <laughs> and I was like, what? <laughs> Tell me, and he said, is this you? And I said, uh, yeah, that's us, that's, that's, Miss, that's Greta. Um, and before we knew it, we were on the Huffington Post and George Takai was posting about us, um, Zoe Deschanel, and then eventually we were on um, todayshow.com. Pop Sugar Moms, a lot of people picked it up. It was really successful for us. And it was really just a result of us getting out there and being scrappy and figuring it out. I'm sorry, I don't know why this keeps going off. Um, and then another thing we learned that I think is really important is, you know, when you're first starting out, you're gonna meet with a lot of people that have opinions and a lot of people that have perceptions. And for us in particular, I think a lot of people that we talked to in the beginning sort of saw Little Hoots as this cute idea. They saw me as this mom that has this cute idea, and that was the perception of me. And I had to be really careful not to let that define me, because Little Hoots is a cute idea, and it is something that um, is kind of warm and fuzzy, and it's um, something that moms use. But it's a huge opportunity, and we truly believe that we are redefining memory keeping for a new generation, and we're just scratching the surface. We have um, over 50,000 downloads today on iOS. We're not even on Android yet. Um, we don't have our desktop launched yet. There's a lot of things, a lot of opportunities that we haven't even um, delved into, and we have tremendous traction. So. What's really exciting, I think, that, and one thing that I've learned is when you are an entrepreneur, you have a vision, and you really have to stick with that vision no matter what people say, no, no matter what that perception is um, or what those challenges are that you, that you come up against. And then another thing is, you know, we've had this fantastic opportunity to listen to our customers and just let them guide us over the past year as they've downloaded the app and started using it. And they've started asking us. You know, we have, we have a vision for what this platform's gonna look like in the future, but they're specifically asking us for Android on a daily basis. Just this morning I had someone post on Instagram, um, can I please have this app for Christmas? I'm waiting for it on Android. I just wanna use this app so bad. <laughs> um, so Android is the very first thing that we're gonna knock out as we move forward. Um, people want easy ways to buy books. They're creating all these memory tiles and they're very display worthy and they want them in books. Um, people want ways to keep more memories and a private place to share with friends and family. Today there's a lot of privacy issues as I'm sure you're aware of on Facebook, especially with children's photos. And so people really want that dedicated space for memories. And then our design packs are a huge part of what really set us apart and make us different. People want more of those design packs. So as we move into the future, we'll be developing more of those and offering more of those as in-app purchases. And then um, just more ways to engage. We're, we'll be developing some marketing systems. And I think what the, the big point is here is that this is what users want. And we're really doing our best to listen to that and to work that into our roadmap moving forward. Um, so this year, Actually, just last month, we were able to launch some new products, and I just wanted to share with you guys. We have these little accordion books. Um, again, back to the point of getting scrappy, we don't have a way yet developed for people to actually um, get online and create these books instantaneously, but we just decided that we were going to have people email us their little hoots and create these books for them. So for the past 30 days, we've been running this campaign, and we've had... Um, tremendous outpouring of people ordering these books and Eric Disney and I are sitting at our computers and we're just creating these books for people because that's what we can do right now. Um, these are some of our other products that we'll be launching this week actually. Um, some pillows and t-shirts and ornaments. Again, these are things that our users are asking us for. Canvases, ornaments, uh, pillows, all kinds of really fun things that we've just learned over the past year that users really want. Oh gosh, sorry guys. Okay. All right, and what, another thing I think is tremendously important is to know your why. Um, being an entrepreneur is really hard, let's face it. I think most of you in this room know that. <laughs> and what's really kept us going on a daily basis is just what we believe in. We believe that keeping memories are important. Um, we believe that it creates stronger connections um, in, 
those relationships in our lives that are the most important. And on a daily basis, that just really keeps us going. And we have our goals and our strategies that are tremendously important, but at the end of the day, knowing our why has really helped us. And to just keep moving forward, a big piece of what um, we've been going through this year specifically is fundraising. Um, and for me, my background is in design and art direction. Um, so fundraising in the business side of this has been a huge challenge for me, something that I've had to learn and really rely on advisors to help me with. Um, and we've been successful at raising the funds we need, which is very exciting. But at the same time, um, it really takes a lot of determination on a daily basis to just keep moving forward. The way it's doing this, I'm so sorry. And then, I think we missed a slide. Surround yourself with smarter people. Um, this is a really, really important one. Do whatever it takes. I think this is, this is probably the most important thing. Do whatever it takes to find those people to surround yourself with that will support you and keep you going on a daily basis. We would not exist as a company at this point had it not been for the incredible people that have helped us along the way. And it's these people that I'm incredibly grateful for, um, fantastic advisors and co-founders that have relentlessly poured in their blood, sweat, and tears to make Little Hoots a reality. Um, I would say if you're a beginning entrepreneur, do whatever you can to find these people, surround yourself with them. You can't do it without them and you don't want to do it without them. And my last point is to have fun. Seems pretty obvious. Um, but it's hard because it's very stressful. But it's important to find ways to have fun. And on that note, I want to share with you all a video. It's um, one of our favorite things that we have started to do recently. And it's also just a really good example of some of the um, fantastic little hoots that our users are sharing with us. I can get my video to work here. We don't have any sound. It, we used to have some. Hey, did you know that God is everywhere? He's in our car and our house with us. He's even in. Oh my gosh. I'm so sorry, you guys. Did you know that God is everywhere? He's in our car and our house with us. He's even in my pants. You do not know what you're talking about. I've smelled your pants and God is not in there. <laughs> tweet, tweet. Tweet, tweet. I'm a baby bird and my name is Rita Vega. Oh gosh. I'm so sorry. Come on, come on. I'll turn you into a frog with my fairy sword. Start to chew by themselves. You guys, this is really frustrating me. I don't know why it's doing this. I'm gonna back it up. Action. Daddy, my zucchini is hot. Can you do your super blow? You do the best super blow. Actually, mommy does the best super blow. <laughs> tweet, tweet. <laughs> tweet, tweet. My name. <laughs> it's so 
ridiculous. <laughs> so, sorry, thanks for hanging with me, guys. Um, but I just, I just think that's such a great example of some of the things that get submitted on a daily basis. People share these with us on Facebook and Instagram all the time. Um, and they're, they're just absolutely hilarious. Those are all real. We made none of those up. Those are all absolutely real quotes that come from kids on a daily basis. And I know I've gone over my time, so thank you very much for having me um, and listening to my presentation. <laughs> Hi, Lacey. Oh, hi. <laughs> I love how you chose to show us the difficulties of entrepreneurship unintentionally through your presentation today. <laughs> yes, that was very not well done. <laughs> Thanks. So I really like your, your app, you know I do. Uh, it's one of the, I think that V1 for all mobile applications is creating something that's engaging and well executed. Um, and you've done that. So, but I have a couple questions. So you're, you've got 50,000 users and you're starting to build out kind of a breadth of products. Do you feel like you're at critical mass to where you should be utilizing that? Or do you think it's possible that you you should be building a higher user base before you launch products. Or are you putting the car before the horse maybe a little bit? Well, our strategy is to create hyper-engaged users, to create value for our users. So we've done a lot of thinking about this. We've talked to a lot of experts about this. We've had multiple conversations with our investors about this. Um, and I think it's a fantastic question. So how do you move forward from here? And, and there was questions all along of, you know, should we have a keepsake store? Should we have in-app in purchases? You know, how does all that work? At what point do you monetize? Should you just focus completely on going out and getting a million users? Or should you focus on monetizing? And so where we've landed with our strategy is very specifically to create the hyper-engaged user. So for the next 18 months, we're going to build out our platform and you know, I was talking a little bit about what our customers are asking for. In that platform, there will be family circles so people can share with their families. Grandparents can log on and see these things. There'll be multiple memory types. Today, we're scratching the surface with quotes and conversations. We're solving a very specific problem. It was not easy to keep those quotes and conversations before. We've made it easy, and we've added the design component that makes it compelling. Um, but there's photographs that are your very best photographs of your children, and there's videos, and there's all those best memories that there's no dedicated place to keep them there. Um, you know, people get on Shutterfly and Blurb at the end of the year, and they spend hours trying to create these books, these yearbooks, and these calendars, and all these things. Little Hoots will be the place where you proactively keep those memories throughout the year as you go, so at the end of the year, all you do is hit a button, and that entire yearbook gets populated, um, or that calendar gets populated, or a mug for Father's Day, or whatever it is. We're making memory keeping easier. So we're focusing on product development, I think is the short answer. Um, and product development sometimes will mean adding new keepsakes to our keepsake store, or it will mean adding family circles, which is a capability inside the platform. But we've chosen to be very intentional about building this for the customer, in a way that it makes sense progressively for them to start using it and integrating it into their lives. Does that answer your question? Y y yes. So my follow-up to that is, the, you have a unique product in the market in that, like, I, I believe that what you can own in the mind and in the market is the mobile application you use when your kid says something funny. Yep, I agree. And all of the things that you said beyond that almost negated. You said like, well, the, yeah, this is really what we do and this is what has got us to this point, but we're gonna do all these other things that aren't that. Mm -hmm. and, and so the, uh, that, that, that would be my only kind of follow up. Okay. Like, make sure you know who you, like, I know you're a good visionary, you're a great visionary, but it's easy to get off course, and when, especially when you're on the right course, I think. Mm -hmm. and And, you segued into an, another, my second question, which was, um, you, you're saying you're, you're talking about how you're listening to your customers, which is exceedingly important. 
right? But you always have the, you know, the sort of famous quote from, from Henry Ford that says, if I would have listened to what people wanted, I would, you know, I would have built a faster horse. And, and so how, how do you plan on, um, how do you plan on overcoming that in order to, instead of, because if you listen to people, you're going to get incremental improvement, right? And when you have incremental improvement, you can't do anything great. I probably learned my best lessons from that working in advertising. Um, you know, focus groups are a big part of advertising when it comes to campaigns. And we would consistently have focus groups, get feedback on creative concepts, and it was fantastic. But what I learned was this lesson that you have to, you have to approach that situation like a lamppost. It's to guide your way. <laughs> it's not necessarily for you to just kind of hang all over it and listen to every single thing that people say, because exa you're exactly right. I think Steve Jobs also has a really incredible um, quote along the same lines as the Henry Ford quote um, around building things that people don't even know they need yet. And we believe in that 100%. We believe that we have a vision for this memory keeping platform that we're building that people don't even know they need yet. We believe we're on the forefront of that wave and that memory keeping is gonna change tremendously in the digital age. It also has a scrapbooking component to it. Um, but we're very careful to balance that. Yes, we're listening to our customers. Yes, we're trying to understand what they want, but we're also balancing that out with a healthy dose of what we believe this product should look like and what we believe that people need to more easily keep their memories that they don't even know they need yet. So I think that's a fantastic point and we're very, very specific about thinking through that as we create our strategy for the future. Hi, um, love the concept of the app. Um, I think a lot of us out here have great ideas and I think what you're doing is executing those ideas. And so I would like to know um, on the marketing side of where did you start beginning of last year when you presented, how many downloads did you have mm -hmm. and what does that marketing um, timeline look like? What are you using to get downloads? You're making videos like this, you went viral. How many downloads did you see from going viral, being on all, all those other sites? Mm -hmm. um, what are you doing to uh, engage with people on getting to actually download it? What is the marketing strategy of getting them to use it on a daily basis? How many people do you have using it daily? Mm -hmm. um, and then also with all your products, how do you see as you're growing forward, is the focus on getting people to download the app and getting to a million downloads and then upselling them in the app to get the products? Or are you focused on selling the products and then getting to download the app to um, save those memories to figure out what products um, they're gonna get? So kind of just explain the strategy of how you're, the timeline of your marketing, what are you using, what is working to get downloads, and, um, and then how, the overall strategy of the app versus the products and how you see that. Sure, okay, so I'll, I'll tackle the marketing question first. So when we developed this platform and we decided to start very strategically with quotes and conversations, we did that on purpose. And that's because these quotes and conversations are very display worthy. Our app instantaneously designs them for you. It's different than what was happening before we had the app. People were just posting these quotes online in their status updates or on Instagram. Um, so instantaneously, as moms started to post these little hoots as photographs, to their timelines, other moms saw those. And they asked the question, what app are you using? So there was this backwards discoverability. So the design piece was important for that and we built that into the product. And to date, we have spent very little on marketing. We have no marketing budget. <laughs> so um, really all of the growth that we've seen has come from the viral nature of these quotes and conversation memory tiles. The memory tile for us is key because of the display worthy quality. Um, I really think that had a big part in helping the Greta story go viral. You see it on Instagram continuously. Um, people will post these on their Instagram feeds. Other moms see it. And I say moms because we are um, primarily targeting moms. Dads use it too. Um, but for the most part, it's something that moms are doing and moms are using. So. Um, the marketing piece is not something we've had a budget for, so we built that into the product, and that's how we have, that's how we've attained all of our traction to this point. So it's been very successful for us. Um, 
And remind me what the second part of your question is. Yeah, so that, I mean, that leads into the second part of the question. So you've been organically growing. So what are you doing in the app? I mean, mm -hmm. I'm sure you have tons of ideas of features that you want to add to the app itself. Yeah. So, you know, when are you making those decisions of, okay, you haven't even gone to the Android yet. So yep. how are you making those decisions? And what are you doing in app to help people share it to their socials so you're getting that organic growth? Uh -huh. And where is that on your priority list of, making those changes to the app versus even actually going to Android and making it you know, more features for the user? Well, to encourage people to share, we send out an email every week, and we call it Hoots of the Week. And we feature the top five with the most engagement on Instagram and Facebook. And we encourage people to share on Instagram and Facebook, and then we pull those hoots that are like the top hoots, and we publish them in an email. And we have a winner every month that receives a mug with their winning hoot printed on the mug. And so that has definitely increased our sharing. But people just want to share these things. You know, they're, they're things that are important to them, that they're funny, that they want to share. Sometimes they don't. That's also what's really great about our app is people do not have to share if they don't want to. And everything is 100% private. Um, <clears throat> so, so that piece seems to be working organically really well right now. Um, but then moving forward, you know, Again, we've had a lot of conversations about the strategy and where we are right now is focusing on the hyper-engaged user. We think creating a platform that moms and parents absolutely love and use every single day because they're going in there to save their very best photos. They're going in there to save their, those quotes and conversations that are happening on the fly. They're putting their videos in there. We're allowing them to save audio clips. If we can create a platform that moms will engage with on a daily basis, we have incredible opportunities that will just open up for us. And we have, um, we think there's a really unique opportunity. We actually see six different opportunities for um, monetizing. And a lot of this is contingent on the, the content that people are generating. We're actually working with a post-production company right now to create a Little Who's television show. We're gonna start it out on YouTube. Um, because if you think about the content the things that these kids say, we always say that they're um, these never-ending content generation machines. They're like our little copywriters just running around, and they're absolutely hilarious, and people love to read the stuff. It's not just the parents. It's um, actually um, one of my past coworkers told me early on that he feels like we're actually creating a joy-sharing platform, and I think that's brilliant. Um, it's true, a lot of people just like to read these things. So, I'm sorry, I'm tangenting off a little bit, but um, we're very clear on our strategy right now. We really feel like we know exactly what we need to create over the next 18 months, and we raised the money to do so. And so, that's what we will be laser focusing on, is creating that platform where people will go on a daily basis and um, really integrate it and make it a part of their lives. I think we have time for maybe one or two quick questions from the audience. Does anybody have a question? Raise their hand. Anyone? Okay, hold on. Thank you. Very nice. Um, quick question. You mentioned content. Who owns the content on things that are public? Do your users... Do you guys copyright that? Who owns that? Because that's your... Sure. Um, the users. The users own the content. And then if they choose to share with us on social media and they either at Little Hoots or they hashtag Little Hoots, then as part of our terms and conditions, we have the right to, sh to reshare that content. And then if we ever use it for the purposes of a television show or things of that nature, we reach out and get very specific permission from our users, especially as it relates to photographs of their children. Um, so we're very careful about privacy in that regard. Lacey, good presentation. Any plans for Android? Oh, absolutely. Android will be one of the first things that we knock out um, <clears throat> the beginning of next year. And we're asked for it on a daily basis, so we're very excited to launch on Android. <clears throat> Thank you so much for presenting. Our final question is, as a community, what can we do to help you? Um, just help us get the word out. That would be fantastic. If you know anyone who needs our platform, um, please tell them about it. Go out to our Facebook page and like it. It's really fun to see all these quotes and conversations come through on a daily basis. You can experience it. Um, sign up for our email. You'll get a hoot of the week every single week. Um, or follow us on Instagram and just kind of help us get the word out.
Thank you, Lacey, so much. Just a couple of quick announcements, but first, before I do that, I'd like to see a quick show of hands. Who's here for the first time today? All right, well, welcome. I don't think we welcomed you in the beginning, but welcome for welcome to One Million Cubs. Also, who has been here 10 times or more to One Million Cubs? Let's see your show of hands. All right. Laura, would you like to tell us why you're here and why you come to One Million Cubs and what you do? Um, well, I'm an entrepreneur, and I have a company called Video Fizz, and I come here to see the lessons that other people are learning, and Lacey was very kind to share, and the AV things, I thought you hung straight through that, babe, you. you did a good job, <laughs> but it's really nice to see how other people are taking their journey and learn from it, so I try and come as often as I can. Awesome, thank you. Thank you. All right, um, there are just a few announcements on the back of the announcement sheets. I won't run through those, but if you would please uh, grab one even on your way out and take a look at those. There are a lot of events happening around uh, Kansas City that we'd like to uh, make you aware of. Um, moving right along, we want to bring up our next presenter, uh, Liliana, who's, going, who's here to present Mobility Designs. She's here uh, taking the stage, I believe, for the first time, so welcome. Thank you. Thank you, and thank you for inviting me. Um, I, you know, I put together this presentation really quickly, so I'm sure I won't do as well as Lacey, but bear with me. I'm Liliana Younger, and my company is Mobility Designed, and it's a medical device startup um, where we focus on creating pain-free mobility aids for people with uh, walking disabilities. I want to share with you guys a video that we put together for a crowdfunding campaign that we're currently running. And it explains our why. It explains you know, who we are and what we're do why we're doing this. And um, it also shows you the product. So here we go. I'm Max Younger, and this is my wife, Liliana Younger. Our company is Mobility Designed. My whole life, I've been watching my dad on and off crutches. And in 2008, he actually had an above the knee amputation. So at that point in time, he became a permanent crutch user. As industrial designers, we're really focused on solving problems like this. And I knew that the status quo was not good enough. Axillary underarm crutches are the same technology we've had since the Civil War. It hasn't changed. Nobody's really solved this yet. At Mobility Designed, we believe that mobility should be pain free and let you live the life that you want to and we've come up with a solution that allows you to use your elbows instead of your armpits to support your weight. I've been on crutches twice in my life, once for a football injury, which took several years to heal, and then once again as a Marine. In the military, you've seen technology grow. Uh, the packs that we use, the boots, the uniforms, they've all had the benefit of new technology. It's ironic, however, that if you get injured, which is common in the Marine Corps, that you end up getting back on the archaic type of crutches that have been used since the Civil War. We've designed a pain-free alternative to the typical crutch that you're used to seeing. So the main body is designed to cradle the elbow and support the user's weight while absorbing the impact of each step. The arm and leg are adjustable for someone that's 4'7 all the way up to 6'8 in height. The flexible arm straps make it easy to get in and out quickly. The cradle unlocks so that the user may reach up or down while still wearing the crutches. The handle rotates out of the way for hands-free walking. The feet are interchangeable and with a push of a button you can easily replace the standard foot with feet designed for snow and ice, sand, or even for athletic use. This crutch was originally inspired out of the needs of permanent crutch users, but it also works just as well for a temporary crutch user like a sprained ankle. You know, I was a sergeant at the time, and I had a tremendous amount of responsibility. The mission had to go on, but I wasn't as capable as fulfilling the mission, nor were my Marines due to the injury. Particularly with the crutches that I was given, it actually slowed me down. We wanted our campaign to have a greater impact, so we partnered with organizations to donate crutches to veterans whose lives can be improved by them. The hope we have for our company and this product is to really have an impact on people's everyday lives and allow them to live the kind of life that they want to live. If you've ever been on crutches or know somebody who uses them, you know how painful they can be. Please support our campaign and help us make this a reality for all those people whose lives can be greatly improved by our product. Oh, levity. 
Um, so you saw some of the features. Um, we're really proud of the design. Our background is in industrial design. Both my husband and I are industrial designers, so we've really put a lot of work and effort and thought into the look and feel and all the features into in this thing. So this is this is our baby. <laughs> this is some of the product that we're competing against, or we will be. Um, and as you can see, it's a, a wide range of aesthetics. Uh, there's different variations of underarm crutches um, and forearm crutches, and the price points also range uh, widely. So we'll be dealing with some of those. Uh, the, the size of the market is, is actually pretty attractive. There's 10 million pairs of crutches sold in the US every year, and the majority of those are for uh, temporary users. We'll be focusing our efforts initially on permanent users uh, to be able to come into the market with a higher end product that is, you know, can create a bigger, bigger, you know, splash. Um, but we have our eye focused on the bigger picture of mobility aids. There's 6.8 million users of mobility aids in this country alone. And we already have ideas for um, our next five products. There's uh, a walker, a prosthetic leg, a wheelchair, and, and so on and so forth in the works. So that's, that's what we're building this company to create uh, a series of products for, for all these users. Um, as far as for our first product and the marketing strategy that will you know, kind of guide us as we go forward, I should say we are in product development phase. So we're not yet selling, we will be. And like I said, we're doing a crowdfunding campaign currently. So that's kind of our pre-launch. Pre um, our marketing will be focused on three main areas, um, our end users, distribution partners, and key partners that we call. Um, and of course, you know, lots of crowd or uh, social media will be leveraging the website and, but mainly for targeting those permanent users, there's expos and shows that focus on those people specifically, like the Abilities Expo, which we'll be featuring at, um, in February for the first time. And there's also lifestyle magazines and publications that are focused specifically on people like my father-in-law, who is an above the knee amputee. Um, the uh, distribution channels will be mainly online and we'll also be targeting some larger distributors like Medline, Hanger, Apria um, for larger sales into nursing homes, hospitals, and, um, and the VA. Um, and our key partners are also very important to our overall uh, marketing strategy because they'll be the ones that help us get this, you know, product in, t in front of the people that need it, right? So doctors, PTs, OTs, or physical therapists, um, occupational therapists, and interest groups like the VA, or uh, yeah, the VA and the Wounded Warrior Project, things like that. So that's a little bit of what we, uh, we're planning as far as marketing, and we've begun. Um, I'm the CEO and founder, and like I said, my background in this is in industrial design, as well as my husband. He's the uh, chief innovator, chief innovation officer, and he, um, he's the designer of the crutch. And uh, we brought in a partner who is um, Michael Litcher. He's got over 30 years of experience in medical device development with companies like GE, so he brings a lot of that um, experience into you know our team. My husband and I have developed consumer product for the last 10 years, but um, he brings all the medical device development experience and dealing with the FDA, getting ready for having a company that develops medical devices. is It's a whole thing in itself. So he brings that experience to our team. And um, with that, I'd like to open it because I'm out of time. Thank you, Liliana. Uh, we'd like to uh, lead with our panels first with questions, and then we'd also like to open it up to the audience uh, after that. Excellent presentation and video, actually. Um, so it seems as though well, there's basically three ways to break into a market as an entrepreneur, and you have done the most difficult. <laughs> so you've invented something. Yes. <laughs> and um, you know, it like, looks cool, but, um, and I'm sure it solves a very functional and medical problem. And there are, there is money, I believe, in the medical device industry. I'm no expert, but I, there's probably a dollar or two. What, 
why are you trying to do distribution and things yourself? Why not say, look, we have 10x the, well, the, the next best product and then let a billion dollar company market and distribute this and they can have it all over the world in a matter of a year where it'll take you your lifetime. Sure, and um, we are not closing the door on that. We've developed a business plan to potentially get us to distribute ourselves. We were thinking about the whole picture in the case that we don't find that person who's willing to take that risk. It's a large capital investment to get into the market. And um, what we've learned from mentors and people we've talked to, um, this has been a long journey for us. Uh, we didn't start a year ago. This product, we've been developing it for years. And we've kept it pretty close to our chest um, because we knew there was patentability in it. And uh, so we've been working on it and perfecting it throughout you know, several years. And only now we're starting to say, okay, well, we have this wonderful idea, but who's really gonna take the risk? Who's gonna believe in it like we do? So, so we've put together a business plan. We've gone out, raised uh, seed funding to get, production, or get prototypes done, start some testing, focus grouping, and proving our idea. So that's at the stage we're at. We're proving that this thing should exist. Um, we're definitely open to licensing it, um, white labeling it, whatever you want to call it. But um, if we find the right distribution partners. And, uh, and we do believe that that would be a great route. We are designers after all. We think you know, we'd like to design more product versus making crutches for you know, the next 60 years. Um, but at the same time, we need to prove that, that people want it. So that's kind of what we have to do. We have to create these molds, make them, make a few of them, sell a few of them, prove that, that people want them. So. Well, if what you're saying is true, I don't think that's the problem. Right, right, like, there's, I almost like, I feel like there's something missing here. Like, how come I'm not seeing this? How come I'm seeing this here and not on the Today Show? Right, if you've really, in, you know, have this product that is, that is dramatically better than the next, um, than the, the next, the next available product. So, is there, do you have the, the, do you have someone on your team that is a medical expert who can, can put a lab coat on and bring credibility and say, this is, you know, this is all the functional and medical advantages to this? We don't. Do you know anybody who'd be interested? <laughs> I mean, a doctor. I mean, there's doctors. Of course. And like, find that doctor. I mean, like, there's something, there's, a, there's something critical missing here because this should be taking off with a sort of an exponential curve, and in, for some reason it's not. Right. Well, it's not in the market yet, so it's not taking off. Okay, and then the last thing I'll say is, can you talk about what you're currently doing from a manufacturing distribution? Uh, you went, you did some detail in distribution. Thank you for that. As far as the plan is concerned, talk about your manufacturing process. Manufacturing process is still also in a plan. We're we're um, what you saw in the video is a prototype, so it's like a single prototype that we have, um, and our plan right now we're getting quotes back from different companies in uh, overseas and nationally that are quoting the tool. The tool is, you know, the multiple tools required to make this um, uh, amount to hundreds of thousands of dollars, or yes. Um, and, um, and so we're really being cautious into making that first gigantic investment. We wanna make sure that, you know, the people that need it really love it. And so part of it is this crowdfunding campaign will allow us to do that first production run and um, get it in the hands of people to use it and tell us what they think. So it's hard to do like a large scale trial or study with a single prototype. And um, you know, it might seem crazy. It's completely different than developing an app where you know you can instantly distribute it to you know thousands of people. Um, product development, especially in some like like large scale manufacturing, is takes a lot of time. It's a monumental undertaking for sure. Hi, uh, love the product, love the presentation. Um, I wanna talk to you afterwards because I have a manufacturer in China that can help. But um, all the points of pain that you're saying is the same thing I went through. I did the same thing with tooling costs. You gotta spend $500,000 before you sell one unit yep. uh, in tooling and production costs, so I get it. Um, I think what Grant's saying 
you know, is that going selling medical devices to individuals um, doesn't seem like the best best path to market. You know, investing the five hundred thousand that's going to take you to even start selling. Um, I think that's what he's saying. So, um, kind of explain, you know. How do you see, you say you have five other products. When do you see the starting development on those? Are you seeing, hey, we're going to raise the money, test, do everything we need to do for this one product, get it out there, and then follow lead with all the other products? Or are you going to develop prototypes of the other products and take a full set to um, you know, some of these other uh, distributors? Um, uh, the first, the first uh option you gave, that's the route we've decided to take, um, mainly because it's a three-person team. We, um, you know, some of us have full-time jobs on top of doing this, so uh, it's hard to focus on development of, for several products at, at this time. We are planning to finish the development on this one, and we're really dialing down the cost of the final product, and that's where we are right now. We. Uh, we know that it's, much, it's a much better route to go like wide distribution, uh, but we do need to get the price down before you know, it's attractive for a large distributor to you know, take it out to the masses. So we need to dial out, down our cost on this product before we start thinking about the next products. We do have prototypes and early concepts for the rest of our products, so we know that there's a, a family of products in the works but we definitely need to focus on this one first and see if it works and we'll fund the future ones instead of going out and raising $5 million to put out you know, all these products that might not sell, we wanna focus on one. Yeah, uh, I understand that because nobody's gonna talk to you unless you have an actual physical product. They're not gonna negotiate with a prototype. I've right. been there. So what is, a, what is the next step? Uh, are you spending time going to pitch at events like this to raise capital? Are you need development? Or what is your biggest um, point of pain in this development that's gonna cost sure. a lot of money before you start selling? Um, right now our focus is on finishing product development and getting that you know, tool started, the tools started. And, uh, and like I said, for that we need to do a little bit more design work to um, dial down the cost. So that's kind of our, our biggest thing before we, before we pull the trigger on tools and before we can have production pieces. We're no longer doing uh, any fundraising. We've uh, raised enough funds to get us to production. So that's great because we can actually go back and focus on product. Um, we did a lot of that earlier this year. And um, so does that answer your question? It's, it's mainly finishing the product, getting it out there, um, and we do have a couple of trade shows that we'll be attending uh, with, with our first production pieces and, and trying to get those large distributors. Um, we had a great meeting yesterday. Hopefully that'll lead to some large distributors picking it up. So yeah, we're a lot of uh, background or behind the scenes work that's not very Instagrammable. <laughs> um, we do wanna also open it up to the audience. So if you've got a question, just wave your hand. We have a question Number right here. Um, actually, I have two. First, somebody asked, um, what is the initial price point that you're going to market with? That's an awesome question, because last week I would have answered one way, and this <laughs> week it's a different one. So I would love to talk to you about that, actually. Um, we are thinking uh, $150 is our goal for, for the consumer. OK, here's the next question. Uh, good morning. My name is Holmes Osborne. Um, I, I apologize if I missed this. Did you say this has been patented or there's co it, it has been patented? We have a provisional patent on it, yes. Okay. And uh, I, I think 150 bucks is way too low. I think it's worth a lot more than that. And um, don't listen to the expert panel. I think you're doing th the right thing. The way, the way that you're doing it is perfect because you need to have a tangible product and sell this baby off to Johnson & Johnson for 50 million bucks or something like that. <laughs> so keep doing what you're doing. I think you're doing great. Thank you. <laughs> Got a Holmes, question? that is what the expert panel said. <laughs> <laughs> question to your left here in the back. I heard you, Grant. So 
I'm curious about how universal the design of this device is for different segments of the market that needs crutches. I assume you've got more on the senior side of the population that this device might appeal to. You've got injured peop people, perhaps handicapped people. How universal is the design? How much have you explored that? And how much do you have to tweak this product to meet different segments of the market? Uh, that's a great question. Um, we would like, well, our goal is to make it Basically, anybody who would use on their own crutches can opt for this, trade up for this, um, because it's pain-free. That's our main claim. And um, as far as, is it perfect for everybody? No, <laughs> nothing is perfect for everybody. And as we learned that early on, as we started doing focus groups with our early prototypes with uh, uh, physical therapists and occupational therapists, they're the ones that specifically, they said, you know, this is not gonna work for somebody that has a certain you know condition where you know the elbow blah 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 I mean there's in medical needs it's just every person you know is very specific so our goal is to just try to capture as many people as possible but realistically we know it's not going to work for everybody um, we would not suggest this for somebody who has balance issues the same way that PTs and OTs do not um, prescribe crutches for somebody with balance issues because they'll fall. Um, so we've talked to doctors who say, you know, I don't prescribe crutches at all. They're too dangerous. I just go straight to a walker. That's what he wants all his patients on. That's, that's fine, you know? In the end, we've seen that um, crutches are kind of a consumer product. So they're a medical device regulated by the FDA, but you can buy them at Walgreens, you know, yourself. You don't need a prescription. So the, the consumer chooses the doctor prescribes and um, recommends. So it's, it's a difficult thing to please everybody. Um, we are finding that out as we, as we focus groups. So yeah, we don't know yet. We don't know how many, how many people will adopt. It's a, it's a hard thing to know. Question in the center. First of all, is there a recent crutch user with sore armpits? This is oh. rather exciting stuff. Um, have you considered investigating the, um, the medical device requirements for overseas, whether it be European, Asia Pacific? And the reason I bring this up is you're getting ready to start heading down the tooling path, and often it's easier to globalize the product up front versus getting the tooling done and then turning around and having to make some small, very expensive tweak so you can sell it in Europe. Um, yes, and I'm glad you bring that up. It is one of the many considerations before we go to tooling, and hence the long period of time that it takes to get there. Um, we are uh, designing based on ISO, and I'm sorry, I don't know the numbers. That's my, my engineers know that stuff, and they are the ones that should know, uh, for CE uh, regulation approval. So just like the FDA here, regulates medical devices in Europe. It's, um, I don't know what the right name is, but I know the symbol is CE and we need that to sell it over there. So we are planning to uh, attain that, that um, certification and we are engineering towards it. So. Question here in the middle. You say you have the funding already to, to provide for manufacturing. Yeah, my next question, well, well, my question would be, have you been to Walter Reed Hospital? Have uh, you been to the VA centers, the VA center here? I, I, I see this as a, a wonderful device. Thank you. Yes, we have uh, engaged the VA early on. We had some early prototypes, and they were very interested in doing a clinical trial. So that is the path, I think, that we'll, um, that we'll take with them. We have to have a significant number of units to you know, start a clinical trial. And we also needed funding and we engaged them early in our process when we didn't have that clear path towards it. Um, it is a long process to get any kind of contract with, the, v, with the, the government. And we've been told we need to be selling for at least two years before we get a government uh, contract. So it's in, our, it's in our plan. It's not gonna happen soon. But, um, but yes, and as far as Walter Reed, yes, we, one of the, the, our 
partner organizations that we're working with uh, through our Kickstarter campaign is, uh, it's called FISH, and they have really close ties, and they, they cater to veterans. Um, they're taking uh, donated crutches that people will back through Kickstarter and donate them to um, veterans that need them. And they have a close relationship with um, people at Walter Reed, and, and so that's also in the works, in the plan. And once we have those production pieces, then we can, we can start you know, calling on all those people that are interested in seeing it. Unfortunately, um, you know, we don't, we're not there yet. <laughs> Question in the back. Hi. Um, first of all, I thought it was a nice presentation. Um, as I was listening to the expert panel, um, I had an observation. This is more of an observation than a question. And that is that um, you're at a point in your company's growth where you're really a different company than the company you started. Um, you started as an idea company, as a concept company, and you're really on the verge of transitioning to being an implementation company. And it seems like that's where, you know, it's sort of, you know, a rough patch, you know, going through that transition. I mean, you've got the product, you've got the idea, you're getting the certifications, but now you need to actually get it out there. And, um, but your, your staff, and, you know, it's a small staff, it's a startup company, isn't focused at all on the implementation part of, um, you know, getting this going, you know, into the next step. Yep. Do you want an answer to that? Uh, question up here, actually. Okay. Uh, first off, I have to say, I think this is really cool. It looks cool. Um, I have a friend who's an amputee, and he uh, opted to go for a more expensive uh, prosthetic because uh, he could get it in carbon fiber. Uh, have you thought about customization options uh, for that, that white piece and other pieces as well that you can sell uh, as like add-on accessories. Yes, definitely. We've thought about that a lot. That's actually the kind of stuff that gets us excited because we are designers. Um, we have thought about it. We've thought about, we actually started down a route of prototyping in carbon fiber. Um, you know, that didn't go great because unfortunately there's like, you know, six people around the world that do this really well and we found one that wasn't very good. But. Um, <laughs> But, uh, and you know, the, the other ones are really expensive. So that's something that we'd love to do down the road. Uh, we do have a more accessible way of, um, of doing some personalization on them, uh, uh, adding pattern and graphics to the, the main body, which is something that we're, we're definitely planning to do when we go into production and offering that as a plus up. Uh, there's there's add-ons as far as accessories that we have planned for, um, you know, I didn't get that far into the design, but um, it's very modular. We've designed it so that you can replace different parts of it uh, so that you can do plus ups and, and yes. So we're definitely thinking about that. It, it just hikes up the price more and up and, and more and makes that market even smaller. So we're realizing as we get further along that we just need to make this, you know, wider and then go this way instead of starting up here. And we're really realizing that as we go, so it's, it's a process for us. Um, one other, can you explain to everybody about, if anybody's trying to develop a product, because I went through the same thing, is that how no investors are gonna talk to you until you have a prototype, and how no businesses are gonna talk to you until you have a manufactured product. Can you please explain that process? And people are like, okay, that's great, come back when you have a production part, and then all the other stuff. Can you just kind of just touch on that? Sure. So, yes, uh, like Tommy is saying, it, it's very true. Um, when you show anybody anything on paper, they're like, great, so, you know, show us something. And hence the prototyping in our house, in our basement. Luckily, my husband and I are pretty handy, and we can make things with our hands. So our first prototypes were, you know, like, PVC tubing, and then the second one, or the next generation was welded aluminum and, and steel, and then the next one was a 3D printed one that we actually you know, paid for ourselves. It was really expensive, but we had it painted and it looks really nice and glossy, and it's right there. Um, and so we've, we've gone the route, um, and it's taken you know, all our savings and you know, everything like that to get to something tangible that we can show people. 
And then it comes to, well, let me try it. Well, no, no, that's like our only prototype. Like, please don't break it. Uh, so then there's that part, okay, we really need to spend another 20 grand in a prototype that people can use. Okay, so we've done that. Um, and all this time, you need people that will believe in a piece of paper. Uh, luckily, we have, you know, family and friends that are, that believe in us, that believe in the idea, and that have, uh, have uh, funded our, our early, early, early stages. Um, and then, you know, now we're finally at a stage where we have, we're that, this close to having a prototype that is like, just like the production parts. But this is many, 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 many thousands of dollars in. And it takes uh, a lot of time if you're doing it yourself. Uh, and, and yeah, people won't talk to you if you don't have a project. We're at that point where it looks really real and people are like, okay, give me, give me like four sets so I can like, you know, show them to people. And, and we're like, ah, that's our only set. And it costs us like, you know, a lot of money and we really don't want to leave it with you overnight. But we really want you to say yes and, and buy it. <laughs> it's a very difficult road for a startup with, with product. And I've seen Tommy's product. Your tool was also very, very expensive. Um, so yeah, it, it is a long road and, and it just requires you to really think that you have something and before you pull the trigger on that, you know, many hundreds of thousands of dollars, you have to be sure that somebody's gonna buy it. Even if it's this route that, you know, like two or three people before, because even the distributors will say, you know, show me a market, you know? And, and when you're saying, yes, this product is better, but it costs twice as much or three times as much as the Walgreens crutches, you know, they're like, well, you know, start selling them and then come back and, and show us your numbers. Yeah, that's kind of the, the process. One final question for you. Uh, what can we do as a community to help you? Oh, well, that's easy. Go to our Kickstarter. <laughs> We're 20 days um, from our, you know, the end of the campaign. Uh, and, and mainly what we want from it is to get the word out, to let people know that, that this product is, is coming and uh, to reach those people that, that will need it and will be looking for it. Unfortunately, it's a time issue, so there's a lot of temper users who reached out and they're like, I love this, I want this, I'll have surgery in December, can I get one? No. So, but we want them to know that it will exist so that when all those people that don't know now that might need it sometime, that, you know, so share it, um, go to our website, that'll take you right to, you know, Kickstarter, and it's mobilitydesigned.com. Thank you so much for your presentation, Thank Lilia. You. Thanks everyone for coming out today. We will see you next week.